Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. On the show today, Dr. Tamara Russell. So she has two PhDs and a black belt, clinical psychologist, martial artist, and neuroscientist at the conference came highly recommended to me there's a bunch of speakers at the conference that i'm like you know what i want to speak to them myself in case i don't get a chance during the conference so tamara welcome yes thank you very much for inviting me both to the podcast and to the conference it's a, a real pleasure and honor thank you you're, you're super welcome I was just saying the conference just passed a quarter of a million people and um nine languages now including portuguese which i think you have some connection with Yes, I have some long-standing collaborators in Brazil, and much of my work has been developed there with with collaborators across a multitude of disciplines. Um, and I guess the richness of cross-cultural working is really something that's infused my work. Uh, but my initial uh, attraction to Brazil was just that this is a culture that loves to be in the body, to move the body, to express through the body. And this was, I think, where I, I really connected with the with the Brazilian culture and community there. I can relate to that. We'll definitely come back to the cross-cultural piece. That's a recurring theme on this podcast, actually. Um, where are you in the world today? At the moment, I'm in Buckinghamshire. I'm just near Aylesbury. It's about an hour or so outside. Very of nice. Here. I had an ex-girlfriend there. Quite pleasant, isn't it? Okay, let, let's hear about your story then tomorrow. How did you get interested in meditation and neuroscience and martial arts and all this stuff? Well, my, my early training was as a research scientist in psychology, and I was really interested in things such as theory of mind, social cognition. Uh, my first trip to Brazil actually was in the context of supporting the development of the neuroimaging community there with some collaborators from the Institute of Psychiatry, where I did my PhD. We were involved in cross-disciplinary work as relates to functional neuroimaging, so using brain scans to try to understand the brain. Uh, And I went there and and worked with some really old friends and and colleagues there. But I got a bit frustrated when I was a research scientist. Uh, I felt it was great to do the research. I loved meeting uh, the client group that I was working with, which was predominantly psychosis, bipolar, kind of disordered consciousness. Um, But I was frustrated that I had to sort of send them home. And one of the frustrations was I was in my own practice of martial arts and Kung Fu. I was feeding my left and my right brain with academic work, as well as deep embodied work based in the Chinese traditions of martial arts. And I had a feeling that I could really offer something to these patients, to these clients uh, that involved more body work. So I decided to go on and do the training as a clinical psychologist. In the UK, this is a prerequisite to be able to do clinical therapeutic work. Um, So I went and did that at UCL, learned a lot, uh, really dove into what is the nugget of the therapy work and creating psychologically safe spaces for people to transform, but still really missing the movement part of it, finding it quite cognoscentric, Loving the models, loving cognocentric. I like that word. I've heard of phallocentric. Now, cognocentric. I like it. That sounds the everything we're against at the embodiment conference. So, um, t- tell me about the martial arts tomorrow, if I may. Just w- what you said, kung fu. Yeah. So I initially started uh, with Shaolin kung fu. I trained in South London with a teacher. Uh, we had a lineage to the Shaolin temple, but of course, it was a more Western version of of what would be taught there. It was light on the formal meditation practice. We had some precepts and tenets that we adhered to in the class, but it was pretty, you know, hard style Shaolin Kung Fu. Um, And at the time it met a monkey mind that was striving and goal oriented and and loving the the pushing and the hard style of finding our limits through the body. Um, But as time progressed, of course, every martial artist meets this in their journey, we we discover that actually going soft can sometimes be more powerful than going hard. And so I became more interested in the internal styles in Qigong, in Tai Chi. And I moved to uh, another teacher who was able to provide me with some training 
more in the soft style, so the yang style of tai chi, what we call the modern yang, as well as qigong, and now a practice which I, I'm particularly interested in, which is that mixture of hard and soft, which is bagua. Oh, right. um, Less well known than tai chi. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So neuroscientist, psychologist, martial artist, in some ways, these worlds have been a bit separate, haven't they? How do they combine for you? Well, for me, the driver, of course, as, as any healer knows, it's, it's our own wounded healer story, which is often a motivator. And I'm very cognizant of, of how my professional journey was also my own personal healing journey. But I was particularly interested in how we help people that can't come to the clinic and maybe can't use words. The okay. people that can't sit on a cushion for whatever reason, maybe they're a bit hyper, maybe they've got trauma, maybe they're in a dissociative psychotic state. How do we offer therapy, meditation, movement practices that can meet the needs of people that can't step into the environments where they're currently offered? And that includes Tai Chi. You know, there's some amazing Tai Chi instructors out there, but they might struggle to have somebody in the class who's dissociative, who's traumatized, who needs it in a little bit of a different way. So this was the driver for a program that I created called Body and Mind Training. And I took the definition of mindfulness from John Kabat-Zinn, which is one of really the, the recognized definitions. There's many, many definitions and lots of arguments amongst all the scholars from different disciplines. But here in the UK, the community of mindfulness has really settled on Kabat-Zinn's definition, which is the awareness that arises when paying attention on purpose, moment by moment, and without judgment. And my mind, trained in these various disciplines, looked at that definition and said, how do we unpack that if we're looking through a neuroscience lens, if we're looking through a martial arts bodywork lens, and if we're looking through a lens of the intention is healing and mind transformation and the pedagogy of learning how to transform your mind. And I put all of these things, I have a picture of a blender. This is sort of my sense. You could call it a blender. Some people calling it a cauldron. I put all of these elements uh, into the mix to try to develop something that's easily accessible, uh, a, a kind of stepping stone, of course, into much deeper and richer traditions, but something that's accessible and can meet people in the real world, in real life, under real circumstances. Now, the Brazil work was really pivotal there because when we're here in the UK, we're relatively safe. Uh, we mostly feel safe in our homes, in our cars and on the streets. We have a lot of psychological lack of safety from our slightly rigid culture and, and etiquette and our British ways. Uh, but when we try to take this training into environments like Brazil, you mentioned your own experience in the favela, you know, trying to think what's needed to offer these trainings when we're in the moment of crisis and challenge and lack of safety. And so I worked with a great collaborator there, uh, Tiago Tatton, for many years. Uh, he did some PhD research using the body and mind training in the public health system with individuals that had low levels of education that really needed it in practical ways, not in this sort of reified. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So do you mind if I jump in? I do occasionally do that as an interviewer. Um, yeah, please do. <laughs> thank you. So what's different when you're in environments which are sort of low education or sort of high intensity? You know, I've taught mindfulness to aid workers and soldiers and police, and it is different than in the Buddhist center in North London. You know, it, it, what, how have you found what works? What's practical in those situations? Well, I mean, the approach is a functional approach based on the neuroscience. So the first question is what's happening in these brains? What's happening in these brains and bodies? And if we imagine that we're meeting in our teaching people who are in high states of stress and arousal, they are in a body mind system that's full of cortisol, adrenaline. This impacts their thinking, reasoning, and learning in certain ways. And so in these environments, of course, 
there's a need to really prioritize psychological safety in the group, in the approach to the group, and in even the approach to the method and the approach to the teaching opportunity. So one thing is we really think, how is the body, brain, and mind from a physiological point of view in order to adapt our teaching style to meet that need? And psychological safety comes out again and again. Many embodied practitioners are incredibly intuitive with this, uh-huh. know how to do it. But there are some things that come from the clinical work around group formation, around managing group dynamics that I think are helpful upgrades. Uh, And particularly if we're now working as we are with with COVID and with this collective trauma and psychosis. When we think about meeting people's needs and learning, this is when it then becomes important to be more interested, not only in what is the person's experience of learning, which might include duration of time in education as one variable. It's not the only one, but it's one that's important. Attitude towards learning in terms of culture, family. And we need that here in the UK when we're working with young people coming from gangs or coming from housing estates with families that haven't been in work or education for several generations. Their attitudes towards learning are a little bit distinct compared to somebody who had my kind of experience. Sure. Um, And this impacts not only in what we present, but also how we present it. So one of the great upgrades, for example, or the things that came from the work in Brazil, we use a lot of video, we use a lot of images, um, you know, Buddhist traditions have done that as well, spiritual traditions have done yeah. that as well for, for, for millennia. But, you know, when we go to the real world examples, we show a video from one of the television novellas, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you explain what a novella is, a soap opera, basically, right? Yeah, I mean, high octane, high craziness. High yeah, I, my, I remember my mum came to visit me in Brazil and she was uh, on a funny, uh, she was jet lagged and she was up early when I came to pick her up from a hotel the next day. And she was watching Transfix this novella because she was like, well, they keep fighting and then they keep kissing each other and then they shout at each other. I'm like, mum, welcome to Brazil. <laughs> It was they're sort of indicative of the sort of high emotional highs and lows that of British people we maybe find a little surprising. You know, she was fascinated by them. Well, and it's been interesting because developing mindfulness teachers in the UK, the discussion is often how do I draw out the observations and what people are noticing and, and get people to speak. And in Brazil, we sometimes have the opposite problem, which is how do we just kind of contain some of this habit, yeah, in the culture of... In Ireland, I found that. In Northern Ireland, it was very hard to get people to just stop talking for a minute. You know? And when I say talking, I mean like habitual blah, kind of talking, you know what I mean? Well, but we bring this then into the training because in the Kung Fu style of mindfulness that, that I designed... Kung Fu mindfulness. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the Bruce Lee. It's the Bruce Lee, you know, here he is on my desk giving me a reminder every day Um, but you know kung fu is in everything we do it's in picking up your coat it's in picking up your shopping it's in mopping the floor it's in every conversation that you have every moment is an opportunity to train your mindfulness so when we go to the students in brazil we one of our key exercises is what we call m chat mindful speaking and listening and we go to the brain and we say listen, this is about training your brain's braking system. It's about training your intentionality system of the brain in order to select the words that are relevant to convey your meaning, to take care of the mind of the other while you're speaking. Um, It's about habit change because we do have habitual ways of communicating that are culturally ingrained as well as the things that are our personal stuff and as well as the things that are part of our training. So we invite them, we challenge them to do, we call it the Bruce Lee training or the Jedi training. When you go into dialogue in pairs, or when we want to have a group of 40 people online sharing their experience without it taking five hours, you're already in a mindfulness exercise to choose and select your words to take care of your own needs, 
as well as hold in mind the needs of the other in your communication. Now, there's huge traditions, insight dialogue, deep listening, you know, many, many traditions have, have really zoomed in on this, but we give a nugget of it framed in the neuroscience and framed in the mindfulness theory. Okay, tell, tell us a bit more about the neuroscience. People love neuroscience. And that's my first interesting thing, like why? It seems to have really something about the brain scans or seeing inside the mystery of the brain. Uh, like any podcast I put neuroscience in the title is going to get more hits, going to get more downloads, right? Like in neuroscience and embodiment, we had a, a speaker on, you know, one of the most downloaded episodes. People love it. First question, why do people love it so much? Why is it this such a popular, fashionable thing? Well, there's maybe two parts to that. And the first part I refer to as neuroenchantment. <laughs> and you're right. It's the images it's this glimpse of something that looks a bit more concrete to help us understand very abstract things that William James himself said, we cannot reliably introspect. Right. Because it's just chaos and we haven't done the training that allows us to see clearly as they would do. This is what enlightenment looks like. It's this blob of color in this place. Like who isn't gonna be enchanted by that? Well, again, and then you add the color and then you add some kind of sexy language. Yeah. And then you add some expertise and people in white coats. Authority, right? You're Dr. Tamara Russell on the website. You know, you're not just Tamas. You'd be Tamas where I come from. But it's like, it's, it's, it's like there's a sort of authority piece, isn't it? Like, I know better than you. There's a danger in that, I think. Well, the, the neuroenchantment bit, I think, is about the presentation of the data and, yeah. and how that's almost a sim becomes a symbol in and of itself. And, you know, I think we can use this skillfully because one of the things that it also does, and we can get back to the problems of the authoritarian uh, aspects of it, but one of the things I think it does is it speaks to our left brain. We're so conditioned in our society to be in our left brain, conceptual, science-based orientation, certainly in the West, um, that the neuroscience provides, I call it, it's like a little bit of food for that conceptual monkey mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to totally stuff that monkey with food and, and neglect the other side of the brain and the experiential but what I discovered, particularly working with medics, with therapists, with nurses, with corporate, those trained in this more left brain ways, if you don't give that monkey something to chew on, yeah, 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 you're not yeah. going to get to the right. So I don't need corporate. Here's a brain scan. Here's a blob. Here's a couple of studies. Okay, can we fucking get on with it already? Like, like it's a door opener, isn't it? To give to give the intellectual part something to do. And medics are the worst in my experience. Business people are tough, but medics are really a tough audience. But I think in my, in the work that I've done, I think I sort of do this pinging between left and right. Okay. Initially, it it is a bit of a hook because it does bring people to the table who would never sit on the cushion. You know, they would just go, "What is this? It's woo woo. It's spirituality. I'm not interested." Sure. Accessibility is there, but it's not, I don't, it, you can use it in that hook way, but I think there's another richness to it. So, I mean, from a movement perspective, one of the key things we work with is the brain's braking system. Mm -hmm. And uh, any martial artist will, will know about this very deeply in their body, the need to control, monitor, pace, and be interested in this kind of go, stop, slow down the velocity of the movement. So we talk a lot about the brain's braking system because it's not only involved in motor braking, but we have a version of it when we notice a mental movement that we want to inhibit or slow down or change the velocity of. Uh, it's also involved in emotion regulation. So if we, we play a bit in the right hemisphere, we can then go again to the left brain and say, but actually what really does the neuroscience say about how to do this training in a way that's kind to our brain and actually works in line with the brain's basic. Okay. So that's the key question for me. So there's, there's, yes, you can use it as a gateway, but is it useful beyond that? What does neuroscience, other than authority and giving people, you know, this, this left brain break or whatever, what does neuroscience actually add to someone who's trained 
in any sort of serious practice of martial arts and mindfulness? What does it bring to the party other than authority? Well, it brings a different kind of efficiency because you're directly working with the natural structures of the brain and how it works. It brings the possibility to adapt or formulate your intervention in wise ways based on the emotional and cognitive differences. Can you give me an example? Because I'm not yet, con- I'm, I'm being a little bit skeptical here. I'm not yet convinced because I've never seen someone read a book on neuroscience and then become a better teacher of embodiment of martial arts, of neuroscience. I just haven't seen that. So what would be a concrete example of an upgrade, as you call it, which I like that language, from, you know, someone studies neuroscience and they come back, what can they do better? They're able to hold both body and mind in a different way for their students. What, by knowing about neuroscience? Let's take a Tai Chi class, for example. Classical Tai Chi. Concrete example, yeah. So if you were training, uh, my training was, was through a Chinese lineage. So you go to a Tai Chi class, Classical Tai Chi, there's barely any talking at all, Mm -hmm. barely any kind of verbal explanation. You're brought into a class. There's one form that you learn. You spend six months doing the same move over and over and over again. That could be the most beautiful, enlightened, incredible teacher in the whole world. But if you're teaching in the West, you'll lose students like mad. Right. I mean, that's culturally inappropriate teaching strategy, though, right? But this is the tradition. The teacher will come, they'll poke one finger on your back. You'll have some incredible experience of a postural change. Beautiful. But it takes a long time to get the benefits of Tai Chi. Got it. Been there. Yeah. If I'm working with a Tai Chi instructor, I would introduce them to the neurocognitive model of mindfulness. I would introduce them to the basics of which body and mind are you working with right now? Are you working with the physical body? Are you working with the subtle body? Are you working with the energetic body? Have you taken account of the emotional body that's part of the system that you're working with? And that's where the clinical piece comes in, the trauma-informed ways of working. You can still teach in your beautiful traditional ways But if I give you this model to work with in your class, you've immediately got more flexibility to meet a wider audience and therefore keep more students and be able to offer them things that are what they need rather than just what you've got to offer. Okay, I mean, there's a few factors there. The cultural piece of cultural learning styles, which I am fascinated by. And then there's having a holistic model of personhood which, for example, you know, what you described, that's, that's been around for a few thousand years in the sort of tantra world. You know, like they would say tantra, I mean sexy tantra, I mean Indian classical tantra. They have a holistic, you know, emotional soul, you know, various bodies. Uh, and then there's what does a neuroscientific research base add? But I'm still not hearing that. Well, for example, if you go into the literature on attention, whether it's in the neuroscience world, or in the spiritual world, we discover that there are multiple types of attention. We know that there's individual differences in how we pay attention. We know that the body and emotions in the body interrupt with our attentional system in a variety of ways. So just saying to people, focus on your body is a type of instruction that for me lacks a specificity. Mm -hmm. So if I'm training someone, we would go, step by step, paying attention, not only to different aspects of body, but also using a variety of different types of attention, as well as training the system in a variety of contexts in order to give more like a CrossFit training for the attention of mind in body. So it's maybe like CrossFit analogy might be helpful here. <laughs> I hate CrossFit, but <laughs> so because the neuroscience research on different types of attention, it leads you to give different instructions that are more nuanced, for example, on paying attention. Yes. Great. There's a concrete example. Thank you. Appreciate it. Like I often find it quite difficult to get to the actual concrete benefits of, of what is is the benefit of this. Okay. Let, what is what is embodiment to you then? You've, we've, we've part of the embodiment conference. Everyone's got a different definition tomorrow. It's a bit of a nightmare for me. Uh, 
it's, it's becoming like mindfulness was maybe 10 or 20 years ago where people say, well, is it that or is it that? What's, what's, what's your version of that? Well, one of my books is called Hashtag What is Mindfulness? Because you're right. These terms are complex. They're, they have different definitions depending on which discipline you're in. Uh, I don't think the spiritual traditions have a kind of reified place in, in answering that definition. And what I was finding was that it was getting muddled for people. They were seeking authority figures on it. And I wanted to bring it right back down to the ground and say, you're your own master on this, but there's a few things you need to know and understand. You can call it mindfulness if it's something about activating your attention system, becoming more aware of what your default mode network is doing, listening and tuning in to how your salience network is reacting and being clear on your intentions. And for me, if you can tick those four things, I'm convinced that you're activating the three brain networks that we know are involved in training the brain and getting the cumulative benefits of mindfulness reported in the literature. But if you want to do that with cooking or sewing or artwork, I just want you to do it. I don't care how you do it. My choice is through the body and movement because I believe it brings some extra benefits because we're working in deep brain structures where habits are formed, including postural habits, kinesthetic habits, emotional habits. So I think embodiment, you're, you're absolutely right, is the word is being thrown around in quite a loose way. Uh, it's not clear communication to the general public. They're getting very confused about it. Uh, and I think that your conference is really an opportunity to bring together multidisciplinary practitioners and, and thrash this out and really discover what's at the heart of embodiment work. And it's about being able to sense your body and include your body as part of your wider consciousness experience. My position goes a bit further because I'm part of a, a more radical embodied cognitive tradition, which may have some alliance with the Buddhist philosophy, but I was not trained in that tradition, so I don't speak from that place. Uh, I come from a cognitive perspective and, uh, and a martial arts perspective. But for me, cognition does not end with the edge of my skin. Cognition is in everything that's around us. Um, so this is some of the work from Francesca Varela, Evan Thompson's work uh, being really looked at nicely by the Mind and Life Institute, who uh, align their work a bit more with the Buddhist traditions and the Dalai Lama. Uh, and here in the UK, from a philosophical standpoint, really getting into the nuts and bolts of the mind-body problem, this is Andy, uh, uh, Andy Clark's work on radical embodied cognition. And so I use that then, of course, as part of my pedagogy and part of my teaching. In Brazil, one of our collaborators in the BMT teacher training there, uh, Clarissa, she comes from deep ecology, is her background. So the deep ecologists, the work of Schumacher College, really saying that when we train and when we do our learning in nature, something very different is happening. Uh, as a Tai Chi practitioner and Qigong practitioner, of course, training in nature, with nature in mind, connected to the natural environment is inherent in all we do. Uh, and that's something I'm really passionate about is how do we stay connected to nature in our practice, particularly in COVID times? But this links for me with the philosophical position of extended cognition. And anybody that's, you know, worked in an office, knows an architecture practice, you know, we, we know that the physical environment absolutely impacts on our cognition and our health. If you put a plant in a hospital room, the person in that room will heal faster than the person that doesn't have a plant in their room. I mean, even at that basic level, nature is part of our healing process um so i don't know if that answers it it's, a no, no, it's great there's loads i could go into there i mean humberto maturana has been confirmed for the conference right this was part of that tradition is yeah that's what i thought tomorrow you've got podcast listeners can't see tomorrow clapping and shouting uh, he's like a total legend and a lot of people don't know who he is you know and i I think a lot of what we're doing in the conference is bringing people together under one tent to say, look, we're not trying to push one particular point of view. We are saying there are experienced voices, you know, like Humberto Madrana. We are saying there are serious researchers who have real scientific background like yourself. We are saying there are 
people from different Asian traditions that have rich heritages that maybe we could be in dialogue with. And it seems like this sort of siloed world of embodiment now, you know, part of my life's work is bringing that all together. Um, so it's, it's it, you know, I'm very happy to hear there are other people that have thought very seriously about what embodiment actually is rather than, um, you know, hashtag embodiment avocado salad on Instagram. This is something yeah. I was becoming, it's one reason I did the conference. I started to see the hashtag and I went, hang on a minute. We need a more serious, serious dialogue about this. Well, okay. So I bring another lens then, which is the developmental psychology lens. And this is vital because this is about how do brains and bodies learn how to be in the environment, how to be in relationship with themselves and others, and particularly with their emotional life. And so taking the developmental lens into account helps with the pedagogy, helps with the design of the pedagogy. Um, but one of my other collaborators there, he's from clowning and performance. Okay, cool. And this creative theater work and theater practices, I mean, it's so rich with fun things that are also about getting extremely vulnerable extremely quickly. So in our teacher training in Brazil, we say, listen, it's an accelerated teacher training because we focus in on this embodiment piece in multiple ways throughout the training. And one of them is we're using practices from theater uh, and from theater and clowning traditions designed by uh, my colleague, Mateus Romero, which really go deep into the body, um, but also go deep into our vulnerability. And that's our ticket if we want to be an authentic teacher is how deep are we willing to go into our own pile of poop uh, before we start sharing with others. And what I've noticed is even very experienced practitioners with decades of sitting on the cushion, tens of twenties of Vipassana meditations, they come into this clowning and theater practices and they get extremely activated and exposed because they're suddenly in a different sphere. They're really in the depths of not knowing. And then we see, what have you really been doing sitting on that cushion for all that time? And what's your practice like when you're in a moving body, when you're exposed, when your wounds are out? Now, we do this safely. We do this with a, a strong psychological safety container because I'm also seeing this done in places by great practitioners where they open up the wounds and they don't have the skills or the resources around their programs to really hold people mm. because it's deep work in brain structures and aspects of psyche where it is our inner child. It is our inner child work coming out when we work with the body and movement and play. So again, a neuroscience nugget, we know that the brain learns best with movement and play. Yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you, you said something earlier that I thought for our audience would be fascinating. So I'm, I've actually got up on the screen here your book, Mindfulness in Motion, which looks lovely and very clear and, um, you know, needed in that there's so many books on mindfulness. And, you know, I also just bought your, um, before all this call, your hashtag, what is mindfulness? But I got it for £1.50. I thought, you know what? I got £1.50. I'm buying it. So um, there's only three left on Amazon, kids. Get out there and get it. But um, yeah, mindfulness in motion. You said something like, when is it better or for who is it better? Under what circumstances is it better to do mindfulness in motion rather than sitting mindfulness? You know, is it people that are ADHD like me who just need to move? Are there any actual definite advantages to it? Like, why do we have the same traditions and Tai Chi and yoga? You know, is it more like this is a little trickier to be mindful, but you it's more applicable to daily life because in daily life we're generally moving. You know, is it about bridging? Is there some neuro, neuroscientific basis I might not know about? <clears throat> Speak to that. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, join, jo join the ADHD club, right? I mean, this is it's also been part of my journey, you know, a kinesthetic learner, a mind that goes a million miles an hour, needs constant stimulation, has to be rewarded quickly, struggles with the longer term gains. And if you're going from a neuroscience point of view, you're looking at the attention network, what we know from the neuroscience research about the brains of people with ADHD. And one of the things that we know is that the brain's breaking system is compromised. Yeah, it's difficult for us to break, whether that's speech, movement, impulsive behaviors, addictive behaviors, sitting still in the classroom. Yeah, but we also know that martial arts training really helps youngsters like this because they are forced through the body work to learn how to activate the brain's breaking system and inhibit. 
And inherent in the body and mind training program is a, a piece of research from the US, which shows that when you train in the motor domain, your brain's braking system, there's a spillover effect into the cognitive and to the emotional regulation domains. So that for me is a vital piece of neuroscience that helps me to design the products, to design the training, to meet the needs of somebody that is not going to be able to sit still and needs to move. The other people that need to move are the ones that don't have time to sit still on a cushion. And this is our healthcare workers, oh. our blue light workers. They go home and they sleep. Yeah, their basic needs need to be met. That's all they've got time for, sleeping, eating, showering, and they get up and they do another shift. Yeah. So I'm not going to say to those people, listen, there's a wonderful evidence-based program. It's fantastically designed. It's a piece of art and beauty called MBSR or maybe MBCT, if you've got some more affective and, 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 and mental health things to go along with your experience. But the practice is a 45 minutes body scan lying down that starts with paying attention to your little toe. Now, I've been a healthcare worker in the NHS. Um, they got 45 minutes and they'll fall asleep if they lie down for 45 minutes. Right. So that's exactly what happens. Or the other thing that happens is they go into their body and they realize that they're full of trauma. Yeah. They go, oh, fuck it out. I'm not doing this again. This is terrifying. Right. So what do we give to those people to input mindfulness as they stand in the lift, going up and down in the hospital, as they're walking down a corridor, as they make a transitional pause between meetings as they roll their shoulders mindfully between clients, as they engage with their colleagues, as they eat their lunch. It's a kind of informed, neuroscience-informed, informal practice methodology inspired by Bruce Lee. <laughs> We're going to have to put Bruce Lee in the title. Everyone loves Bruce Lee still. Good old Bruce. Finger so point. The, third, the third group then, the third group is the people who for whatever reason, and it's usually trauma, are not able to be in their consciousness, whether it's their body consciousness or their mind okay. consciousness. They're really dissociated people. So this is dissociation from trauma, psychosis. Some people call it spiritual awakening, uh, spiritual crisis, de uh, depersonalization, uh, multiple identities, people whose affective experience is so intense that to say sit, sit still and go to your body would actually be cruel, especially if they're doing it with an app, unsupervised, without a, a mentor or a coach or somebody to hold them, if they go to their body and they get overwhelmed. And this is trauma-informed mindfulness. And, you know, would that person get on well in a Tai Chi class? Probably. Probably not, yeah. yeah. They need a particular kind of teacher, a particular right. kind of setting. Tai Chi is wonderful for them, but they need to be stepped into it in a more safe and what I call scaffolded learning. Okay, okay. I just point listeners to David Trevelyan's Trauma Informed Mindfulness. Uh, he's another conference speaker and got a good little book about this. And there's a video on your site here, nice site, by the way, that says, um, what mindfulness practice is right for you? And this is such a simple question but just brilliantly needed now because often it's all put in a bucket, isn't it? Well, you could do yeah. mental meditation. You could do body scanning. You could do mindful walking. You could do Tai Chi. You could do Kung Fu. And it's like, well, yeah, but the problem now is not, I can't find a teacher because there's apps and there's teachers everywhere. The problem is which one do I, which one do I choose? Right. So this, this strikes me as a very, um, it's not, the, you know, what is mindfulness was the book for 10 years ago, but the book for now is like, which mindfulness practice, Right. Like that, that seems to be the question of the era. Yeah. And in, in hashtag, what is mindfulness? There's a whole chapter on that. And uh, using a phrase from the contemplative traditions, it's, it's the approach to the cushion. This is actually probably even more important than what you do when you get on it. Right. Because it's about checking your motivations. It's about checking your intentions. It's about asking questions about how you like to learn your learning style, your cognitive diversity. It's about thinking about how will I be supported because I am, if I'm in it for real, entering into a psychologically transformative journey. And if you don't meet some crap on the way, you're probably not really doing that much. So how will I resource myself when I meet 
the reds, as I call them, when I meet the challenges of the practice. And the secularization of mindfulness has made this more important than ever that we take control of our own spiritual journey because we don't have the guru holding us. We don't have the, I want to get to enlightenment for the benefit of all beings, intentional container. Where is that? I mean, the mindfulness dialogue has been all about that. You know, we stripped away the contemplative and spiritual traditions uh, and just took the practices. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing, but I am saying it's then your responsibility to fill that gap by saying, why am I doing this? What is my motivation? Where might I trip myself up? Who's going to help me? You know, I don't just say, oh, that's it. let's go to the gym. We think like, yeah. what classes do I like? Yeah. Have I got the physical stamina to do this class. What clothes am I going to need? No choices. Is it near my house? How much does it cost? Do I need a personal trainer? And with mindfulness, we seemingly don't bother to do that. We just go, oh, let me get this app. Oh, it didn't work. Oh, yeah. let me get this app. Oh, my God, I had a panic attack when I tried to do a breathing exercise. Sure, and sure. And that's common. About 30% of people may have that experience. You wouldn't, Probably yeah. that will be more now with COVID and masks and all this health anxiety that's coming for people around. Health anxiety particularly, yeah. yeah. As you say, you wouldn't just go into a gym and start throwing weights around, right? You'd get a personal trainer. You might at least be shown the equipment by the gym. You know, you'd have some sense of like, uh, look, this is potentially great for you, but you could also pull your shoulder out if you try and pick that big weight up over there. And you might not want to try an Olympic lift on day one, you know? And it seems like some of the Asian traditions are Olympic lifting for sure. So I think this is going to be the future of it is more distinctions of what exactly is mindfulness. Like, can we put, I, sometimes I see some of the studies and I think, how have you replicated that? Because there's so many variables that are hard to replicate, you know, the practice of the person teaching, for, for example, as opposed to the actual technique, like it was a neutral thing. Right. So but, that is another type of embodiment, what you've just yeah. hit on there. So if I may, that that's a little one to just open a small circle. So in the mindfulness community in the UK, there's something called the MBI TAC, the Mindfulness-Based Teachers Assessment of Competency. And they've developed six uh, frames that are the frameworks around what makes a good teacher. Right. One of them is a, is, a, is a domain called embodiment. And I know that they've been struggling with this because it is so tricky. Uh, and sometimes they've been asking me, you know, how do you know in your martial arts class when your student is ready to be a teacher? How do you know when they can progress from being a student to a teacher? What is it about the body and the embodiment of the martial art that tells you this person is ready to teach? And in the Brazil group, we, we just zoomed in on this competency because all the studies show that it almost probably doesn't matter what you deliver. Yep. It's the embodiment and the personal practice of the teacher, this etheric thing that we're struggling to name, but everybody knows the minute they experience it, this is the thing that accounts for the largest variance in the outcome of yep. these studies. Yeah, the joke I make is I'd rather hear the Dalai Lama read me the back of a uh, of the back of a, um, a crisp packet than Donald Trump read me a Tibetan Buddhist meditation. You know, as a teacher, there's there's the transference from their own state, their own embodiment. That's that's kind of key, and I, there's some fun studies on that that I've seen. But that's embodiment at different levels because there's the embodiment of the speech, the action. There's the embodiment of how is this person walking the walk and talking the talk. Yeah, and, and then in the in the Chinese traditions, of course, and the others, there's a whole other layer of transference of knowledge from one consciousness to another that the Western scientific model is, is completely unable to speak to uh, with its current methodologies. So I'm aware of your time, I'm aware of your time here. I, I want to ask, where do you think this is all going? When we do have these distinctions through studies that maybe weren't there in the Asian traditions, when we, we are sort of breaking it down and saying, okay, this is what my, this is you know, the, the problem with doing mindfulness without the spiritual traditions. This is the factors in the teaching that are really important. Once we've kind of, research and kind of open these out, broken it down a little bit. Where, where do you think this is all going? For me, in my martial arts hat, with my, my own spiritual practice hat on, this is about really supporting people to find and develop their own spiritual paths of embodied spirituality 
in the world, connected to nature, moving away from the more authoritarian, patriarchal lineages, whether that's in the science community or the martial arts community, to a more grounded, earth-connected spiritual practice that you design for yourself, drawing upon the traditions, being thoughtful about your own needs and competencies and capabilities with a light guidance and mentoring that doesn't foster dependency, but rather empowers you to find and trust in your own inner knowing through your body, through your relationship to yourself. And my struggle when they have this picture of Bruce Lee in front of me on the table is where are the female martial artists? Where is the yin, the real yin of martial arts practice and tradition? And I'm increasingly finding in my martial arts community that these are the conversations that are happening. How do we bring a more powerful yin and how do we soften the yang to come to balance, balance ourselves internally with our yin and yang, balance our systems of education and business with yin and yang, and fundamentally balance our world. But it starts with self. And science and medicine has fostered the dependency, which is problematic. I totally agree with you. Very problematic. And looking at the shadow of my own work as a scientist and as a psychologist, working within evidence-based practice has been a two, three-year piece of work that's ongoing for me. How do I take what's helpful and have the courage to drop and let go the things that I can really see now, here and now in our modern times, are not helping people and may even be harming them? Okay, thank you. Just because I'm curious, what's with the psychedelic alligators behind you? YouTube listeners will be able to see them, but podcast listeners, there's several pictures of sort of brightly coloured alligators, it looks like, behind you. They're very cool. Well, my love, these are dragons, of course. They're, they're dragons? <laughs> no, not alligators. Okay. These are dragons because I'm developing some work around the dragon way to mental wealth. And these are colours of my day where I've been monitoring how much I've been with my blue dragon focused, attending, Okay. how much I've been with my green dragon, taking care, nourishing, feeding myself in different ways, Yeah. and how much I've been in the red when I've been stressed out or anxious. And well, That was a bad day with the red tail. That was a, was a bad morning or a bad evening? That was a, that was a difficult and challenging evening that I experienced. Got it. Okay. Wow, I'm glad I asked now. That's a really awesome way of uh, mapping your day and your states, isn't it? I love it. But that's for me embodiment because I want my students to know that I'm not fixed. I'm not perfect. Yes, I have red. Yes, I have whole days where I'm feeling red and I do my best to find my practice and find my feet. And I know how to get my greens and who to ask for help. But life right now is pretty challenging, even for teachers and therapists. Oh, and yeah, that's good to admit that, huh? This is this is... Mine isn't quite so pictorial. That's my embodiment conference uh, planning. It has a few smiley faces on and quite a lot of numbers and a few different color codes, but uh, I like these visual things. Listen, so in terms of finding you on the internet, it's Dr. Tamara Russell, T-A-M-A-R-A-R-U-S-S-E-L-A.com, right? Dr. Tamara yeah, Russell. E-double-L, yeah, Tamara Russell, E-double-L.com. Very nice. Um, that's the best place to get in touch with me or find me. I've got a YouTube channel as well. Um, and you can also go to the Mindfulness Center of Excellence.com for some of the collaborative work I do with arts, creativity, technology, uh, weaving the BMT methodology and the neuroscience martial arts approach into all sorts of sectors and projects and collaborations. So thank you. For the it's nice to meet you. Lots of it. I think we could have done another three hours at least on half those topics. And I'm definitely going to have a good look at these books. The hashtag what is mindfulness. Three ninety nine. Look at that. One pound. One one pound and five pence used. Um, Kindle three seventy nine or mindfulness emotion. A mere twelve pounds. It's about fifteen US bucks. So that. And I just did the look inside on that. It looks really readable and accessible. So that might end up. I being- do recommend the paper rather than the Kindle. I've had a little bit of feedback that the Kindle has 
some issues which I haven't managed to sort out. So I do recommend uh, the paper copy. That, that's just feedback from, from people that have been buying it. So I know we like to read on Kindle and, and we want to preserve it. I like the paper. I like to smell it. I like to, be able to write notes in it with my pen. It's not the same electronically. And I, I tend to listen to audio book. And then if I like it, I buy the, the other word as a sort of reference, you know, like as a sort of library. So anyway. Yeah, so my SoundCloud is the other place. Uh, Tamara two, I think I'm Tamara Russell 2 on SoundCloud. So there's tons of audios, uh, practices, mindful movement things, static things. Um, mixed quality because I'm just uploading what I can to share as freely as possible. So please be patient and kind. It's it's not all studio quality, but it's it's out there for people for free. Okay, and I, there's some good little videos of yours that are very digestible. I listened to a couple ahead of this. I was a bit short on time, but I found, I found some really good little little short ones like myth busting mindfulness. I think I'll probably listen to that later. So that looks like a good one. Okay, yeah. tomorrow it's a time to run. I want to respect yeah. your time, and I've got another thing here. So I will see you at the embodiment conference tomorrow. Great. Work well. Work with your dragons. Take care. Bye bye. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it. Um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it. Old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites, his comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah and i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. OK, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.